Okay. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, I haven't been on a stage like this with the spotlight in my face since high school. It's a little weird not being able to see everyone, but I, I hope to get a chance to speak with you after. Uh, Joel's very sorry he couldn't be here. We, we just found out about this on Monday and we had another event scheduled in our office, so, so he apologizes and I, I hope I uh, represent him adequately in his stead. Uh, so Joel Young uh, was born here in the Bay Area, he was raised here, he went to schools here and went on to uh, Cal, he got his undergrad degree there and then got his uh, law degree at Berkeley Law. Uh, he was appointed to the AC Transit Board in 2009 uh, when we were in the midst of this great economic recession. Uh, one of the first things that Joel recognized is that at that point in time, any proposal that required new spending was pretty much dead on arrival. Uh, so he decided to focus on some of the wonkier aspects of what the agency does, specifically on contracting, uh, to try and change agency rules, to change their definitions, to get them to contract more with a lot of the local businesses that we have here in the Bay Area. Uh, as part of those efforts, he supported a, a Buy American resolution. Uh, that Buy American resolution has since been implemented and it led to the shifting of a bus contract. Uh, formerly, AC Transit was buying its buses from a company called Van Hool in Belgium. Uh, they're not, now buying their buses from a company called Gillick in Hayward. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about that over the course of this campaign. Uh, it's supporting hundreds of jobs for people who live here in the area. Uh, and that's something that he's very proud of. Uh, he's running for state assembly because he thinks California can do much better. Uh, the state of California spends billions of dollars every year uh, purchasing goods and services. And Joel thinks that when they're spending that money, they should be spending it on firms that uh, invest in California businesses and, and put people in California to work. Uh, Joel's also running because he's very concerned about the status of young men of color in this district, uh, the educational outcomes for Latino and African American, African American males in Assembly District 18 have been very poor. Uh, we need to do much better with that community and, and one of the things Joel's identified is the need for early childhood education. Uh, the achievement gap starts very early in life and it builds over time, and as you move farther down the timeline in the life of a child, it gets more expensive and more difficult to intervene. Uh, first grade reading levels predict a lot of what's going to happen in high school. The state of California actually uses third grade reading levels to predict its future prison population, which is a shocking statistic. Uh, we need to do much more with kids that are two, three, four years of age that come from low-income communities. Uh, so I think I'm just about out of time, and I'll pass it on. Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, I'm glad to be here. It's my pleasure. I'm Rob Bonta. I'm the vice mayor of the city of Alameda. I, prior to that, I was an elected public official on the city of Alameda Healthcare District Board, and I'm a deputy city attorney in the San Francisco City Attorney's Office. I'm also a father and a husband. I live here in the East Bay in the district with my wife and my three children. I grew up in La Paz, in uh, the Central Valley in the Tehachapi Mountains outside of Bakersfield. That was the headquarters for the United Farm Workers of America movement. My parents were farm worker organizers with the UFW. They worked directly with the great legends Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez. And I'm extremely proud that my family was part of one of the greatest social justice and racial justice and economic justice movements in the history of our country and of the state. I, uh, after growing up in La Paz, my family moved to Sacramento and I went to public schools through high school in Sacramento. And on the strength of public schools at that time, I was able to achieve my personal dream of going to the best colleges and universities that I possibly could. With the help of financial aid and being a, a national soccer recruit, and by, by working my way through college by cleaning laundry rooms, I was able to go to Yale College. I got a scholarship to study politics and economics in, in England at Oxford, and then I went to Yale Law School. As soon as I uh, was done with um, my, my studies and was able to take advantage of those wonderful opportunities that I was given, I wanted to come back to Northern California and serve my community. And that's what I did. So I, I've been here in the East Bay. Um, I've, I've, it's been my pleasure to be a publicly elected official. I have four priorities that were my top four priorities since being a publicly elected official. They will continue to be my top priorities at the state level and they are the following. One, we need to improve our public schools. Two, we need to make sure we have safe streets, uh, public safety. Three, we need to make sure we create more good jobs and revitalize our economy. And four, we need to make sure that we have a strong 
social service safety net to take care of the most vulnerable people in our population. And those are areas where we've been able to achieve a lot um, in, in Alameda. Uh, we, for example, generated $84 million through a, the school parcel tax to, to support public school children, and that could not be taken away from the state. We're also creating 6,000 to 9,000 jobs in the East Bay, which will be a nice economic shot in the arm for the East Bay by redeveloping Alameda Point, something that just got conveyed from the Navy to the city at no cost. So there's some exciting opportunities, but the state is where these decisions, um, big decisions are made with respect to public schools and social services uh, and job creation, and I think the state can and must do more for us to have healthy communities. I'm really proud to have a lot of support here in San Leandro, including the endorsements of Alameda County Supervisor Wilma Chan and former Supervisor Alice Knight Bitker, as well as uh, the Police Officers Association, the Firefighters, Mr. Bunter, and the Time Council. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. It's hard to see, so. Uh, my name is uh, Bel Guillen, and I'm the former president of the Peralta Community Colleges. I've served on the Peralta Colleges the last six years, and uh, I'm very proud of the work that I've done there. Uh, I'm running because, like many folks in the East Bay, uh, I'm the first in my family to graduate from college. Uh, as families prepare for graduation, uh, I must note that uh, this graduating class has seen nothing but cuts from kindergarten to 12th grade. Now stop for a moment. Nothing but cuts the last 12 years. What are we doing with our priorities? Where are our priorities? I'm running because I want to make sure that the same educational opportunities that were afforded me are available to other students that are coming up the pipeline. Uh, I grew up in a very working class family. My dad is a baker. Uh, he's been at the Hilton Hotel for 39 years. My mom is a cook. Uh, she works at a convalescent home cooking for seniors. And she's been there for over 30 years. Uh, thankfully, they had good union jobs that allowed me and my brothers the, the ability to go on and go to school. Uh, and I've never forgot that responsibility. When I got to Cal, I was very much uh, motivated to make sure other folks uh, that we went out to the communities, recruited students, I worked in inner city high schools, and education has always been a passion of mine because education really saved my life. I've served on the Peralta Community College Board the last six years, where I focus on improving educational access, deliver, improving health care outcomes, and jobs and career training. And we have actually increased our number of students that actually transfer from Peralta to the UC system over the course of the last six years. I've helped improve educational health care access for our students by actually uh, providing health care access to 30,000 students by working with the county uh, to make that happen. And lastly, we've been a really uh, service provider for our local businesses, our local community partners, by providing small business owners the tools and the career training uh, classes that they need to be able to run successful businesses. So I'm running for the State Assembly because I want to make sure that um, we get our budget in order. Uh, I'm the only candidate that's running who actually has a background in finance. I've worked the last uh, 10 years as a financial advisor, raising billions of dollars for California school districts. And I have the legislative experience also to get things done. But that's the skill set that I bring to Sacramento. And I hope that you all will stand with the nurses, teachers, and Sierra Club and vote uh, for me, Abel Guillen. Thank you very much. Now move into the next segment of the conversation tonight. Candidates are going to have two minutes to answer audience questions. Uh, do I have any cards, Charlie? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Bonta, you will speak first. Uh -huh. Again, you will speak Anyone second. else have, Again, you have a question? <coughs> any, any other cards? The white card? Right here, Charlie. Right here, Charlie. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You need one. Yeah. Uh, house lights would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, you have the extra white cards up there? Oh. 
Uh, so one of the things that Mr. Young came out in support of uh, in the fall was making it easier for local districts to pass tax measures. The two-thirds the two -thirds, uh, majority is not democratic, uh, and it makes it very hard to fund things like San Leandro Hospital that the community clearly values. Um, so that's something where I think that we just need to be very practical and very realistic about what's going on at the state level, what's going on at the local government level. Governor Brown has come out partially in support of localizing more services. Uh, I think the realignment plan for the state prison population could be a very good thing in the long term. He needs to go even farther. He vetoed a bill uh, that Senator Leno introduced that would have allowed San Francisco to pass its own vehicle license fee uh, to fund critical services there. Uh, I think that was a bad decision. Uh, I think that's a debate that we need to continue to press uh, because we value healthcare access here in the East Bay. We value our community hospitals. And I think that the key long term uh, to making those hospitals viable is making it easier for us to make our own decisions about the community services that we want to fund and support. Uh, so, thank you. <laughs> Nothing wrong with any questions. Okay. Very good. Our second question, which will be led off by Mr. Guillen, will be this one. From a disaster preparedness perspective, how can you ensure that our schools are prepared, supplies and skills, when the ground does shake due to an event occurring on the Hayward Fault? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Public safety and the safety of our children is of vital importance. I've worked uh, my entire life, actually, the last uh, 10 years modernizing schools for structural safety purposes up and down the state, and also modernizing schools that work falling apart. Uh, one of the first things that I would do is, um, as an assembly member, uh, because I know the schools and the, the shape that they're in, they don't have funds to do this, uh, but as an assembly member, I would work with federal agencies to actually make sure that every school site on their playground actually has a disaster preparedness kit uh, available, a trailer, if you will, that can uh, make sure that when a, a natural disaster happens, that not only the skill of the students safe, but they have access to water, that they uh, make sure that it becomes a community hub when people need to be housed, that they have first aid equipment. And these are actually programs and grants that are available through FEMA, through the feds. And uh, I've done this work actually in Kern County in a lot of rural communities, and there's nothing to say that urban communities like ours here in San Leandro, Oakland, and Alameda uh, should not have access to the those <laughs> funds. Um, and so I don't think that's something that's going to cost you money, but it's being resourceful and connecting the dots. That's what I'm successful at doing at Peralta, and uh, that's what I want to do as assembly member is make sure I bring those resources through my office uh, to the local level. Thank you. So I, I think Mr. Guillen is correct that one of the key functions for lawmakers is to act as a, a, an interface between federal lawmakers and local lawmakers, make sure that you have strong relationships. I know that that's something that Joel has worked uh, very hard to build over his career uh, as an elected official. Um, I think that the, the issue of uh, seismic upgrades for facilities in the Bay Area uh, is a major one. Uh, it's something that we need to be addressing with our hospitals and our schools. You know, I, I think, again, this kind of points to that local decision-making point that I was making before. Uh, I think another thing that we need to do in terms of our bonds is just be more transparent with voters about the bonds that they're passing. Uh, one tactic that is used by uh, firms that put bonds on the ballot is to defer interest payments far into the future uh, so that they can pitch that as something that's, you know, it's not going to raise your taxes at all. Uh, in the long term, that ends up costing voters much more money. Uh, and again, this is one of the reasons that I think that we need to lower that threshold from two-thirds to a simple majority or 55% to pass these measures. Uh, we'll look at whatever's feasible there. We'll do polling on it and see what we can get done. Uh, because we should be able to have an honest and transparent conversation with voters. They're intelligent. Uh, talk with them about the needs that we have uh, and finance those needs in a financially responsible way. So, thank you. So, I've been talking about public safety in this race from the very beginning, and I was the only candidate talking about public safety for a very long time. And I'm proud to have the endorsement of every public safety organization that's gotten involved in this race, fire and, and, and police. And 
this is an important issue of, of, of seismic safety and safety in our schools, and, and there's a couple of areas where I think we can make a difference in the state assembly. There's, there's, on the hospital side, we were talking about hospitals earlier, there, there are requirements for seismic upgrades. But they're unfunded mandates, though, however. And so there's hospitals, uh, like Alameda Hospital, that find it very challenging to seismically upgrade. I would propose a statewide school facilities bond that would rebuild our deteriorating school infrastructure and make them all um, uh, seismically upgradable and, and seismically sound. I think that's very important. I think it's obviously very important to protect our children, to reinvest in education in our schools, and to address the public safety all in one. It's like a three-four. Uh, you, you get three things in one. Um, and also, I think it's very important for localities to have a emergency preparedness plan and to have exercises where uh, you actually play out the roles. And we did that in the city of Alameda, where uh, I oversee Alameda Fire Department on the city council as well as the police department. We did a joint exercise where um, they uh, did a disaster preparedness plan and executed it at the school, at the local high school, Alameda High School. And so everyone knew. Uh, what the role was, where the resources were, um, and how to make sure everybody was safe, where to go, when, etc. So that's an important component. Um, it's not just the resources, it's not just the, the seismic uh, retrofitting, but it's also the, the planning. And um, we live in a quick country. It's reality. It's not, it's not a matter of weather, it's a matter of when we will have a very significant earthquake in, the, in this area, and, and everybody uh, uh, probably can do more to be, to be safer and more prepared. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This question can be led by you, Mr. Goodman. It's one near and dear to me, so let's see if we have a good answer. How would you stop unfunded mandates on local government? Great question. You know, I, I think that the state, again, because it's it's broken in terms of its ability to make decisions about revenue and spending, uh, has frequently uh, left city and county governments with unfunded mandates, has taken money back from city and county governments to uh, balance the budget. Um, you know, a, a recent example, uh, I think, uh, was just reported on recently, uh, the governor's plan to take the money from the mortgage settlement uh, that was done with banks uh, which would help to, to mitigate some of the, the massive damage that the foreclosure crisis has done to our community. Uh, I think that's short-sighted. Uh, you know, and I, I know from talking with him about it this morning that that's something that Mr. Young would certainly oppose. Uh, last year, the state tried to take a billion in funds that were set aside for First Five by the voters uh, in 1998. Uh, first Five was a tobacco tax that funds early childhood education for uh, low-income children. Uh, the governor was sued over that. He lost. You know, that's not the way that California needs to, to balance its budget. It can't be balancing its budget on the backs of programs that are meant to fund uh, different things, and that includes city and county government. Uh, so, you know, I know that that's something from talking to him a uh, great length about it that Mr. Young is very aware of, uh, and something that, that he, would, he would really oppose as part of budget negotiations. If you want to talk about, you know, where is this all to die on, it's, it's that. It's taking money that was mandated by voters uh, for other programs, uh, and trying to use that to cover up and paper over uh, the state's uh, chronic problems with its structural deficit. Thank you. Thank you. So this is an issue that I have dealt with in many times as a local public elected official, as the vice mayor of the city of Alameda, and as a director of the Alameda Healthcare District. In the healthcare district arena, we had an unfunded mandate imposed on us to seismically retrofit our, our Alameda Hospital, which was multi millions of dollars and very difficult when we were a freestanding community hospital on, on, on short or on small um, profit margins. Uh, similarly, our, our schools have all sorts of requirements on what teachers must teach and what students must learn um, and, and, and how teaching must occur without the, the funding connected to it. Um, so. It happens time and time again. I think legislation should have either a dedicated revenue source attached to it, so it's a funded mandate or an opportunity for financing, or in, in the end, because the state has failed time and time again to generate adequate revenues to fund the services that we care about, provide an opportunity for localities to generate that revenue themselves. 
So if they're going to impose mandates and they're not going to fund them, then they have to let localities be able to generate that revenue themselves. And that means that can mean a couple of things. It could mean lowering the two-thirds threshold for passing a parcel tax. Maybe a smaller supermajority, like 55%, or even a simple majority, 50% plus one. It could also provide the opportunity for localities to generate revenue through, through methods that the localities typically haven't had control over, like a personal income tax or a VLF, which was discussed earlier. So I think it's far, definitely imperfect policy to create unfunded mandates without an opportunity to uh, generate that revenue or finance um, uh, the, the, the mandate, the regulations, or to attach real revenue to it from the state. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. I actually worked in the state legislature before. I'm the only candidate who actually has legislative experience. I actually worked for the Appropriations Committee, and that deals with all the money that comes in and out of Sacramento. So one of the first things that I would do is uh, if the state doesn't have its financial house in order, then we should not put any other further mandates on local governments, period. Uh, and I think that's a very easy way of looking at legislation that comes through. When you score the stuff, the analysis comes out, it's going to cost, if you're trying to make the locals uh, provide uh, some sort of service or some sort of uh, safe uh, issue, you have to look at it. The exception that I would look at if it's a safety issue, uh, perhaps it's a public health issue, uh, something that I will look at, and it has to be an extraordinary case where uh, you know people's lives are in danger, where the state would say, hey, we have to get this done. Otherwise, I would make sure that we stop those unfunded mandates by stopping with the Appropriations Committee. Thank you. This one. What will be the first piece of legislation that you introduce? Great question. Great question. Great question. There's two pieces of legislation that I'm really interested in getting passed early on, should I be fortunate enough to be the next assembly member from this district. The first one deals with redevelopment agencies. As a local publicly elected official, we have really suffered from the eradication of redevelopment agencies. Tax income and financing has created the opportunity in the East Bay to turn blighted areas into economically revitalized centers. Now that, that tool is gone. In the East Bay area, in this district, we have a number of former military stations, and there are former military stations throughout California. I would try to pass a piece of legislation that creates an exemption for former military stations which would still allow for the redevelopment tool of tax increment financing to apply which would help turn those um, areas which are, 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 are not economically revitalized into economically revitalized centers and that, I think that would help create jobs in the East Bay, create good jobs and create an economic stimulus. So that's, that's one. Number two, we have challenges with public safety in this district and throughout the state and I would argue for the creation and, and try to pass a piece of legislation that creates a uh, emergency prevention fund so that when certain communities are facing spikes in violent crime um, or cuts to prevention officers and law enforcement officers, they could draw upon this fund to help keep the community safe in those areas which are really struggling and need help. Those are the two pieces of legislation that I would introduce early on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's, everybody wants to fund schools. The state makes, makes it very difficult to fund schools at the local level, especially since we have Prop 13 in effect. Uh, the first piece of legislation that I would want to do is a constitutional amendment that would lower the threshold required for local communities, such as school districts, community colleges, uh, to raise local revenue. Uh, instead of the two-thirds level, it's hard to get anybody, uh, two-thirds of any group <laughs> of people to agree to anything. So I would want to lower the threshold required to pass local revenue measures uh, to 55 percent, making sure that the senior citizens are exempted from any of these uh, taxes that go forward. Um, I think that's something that's reasonable. I think it's something that can be done. And I think it's something that will have an immediate impact on the lives of our children and our communities to keep our libraries open, to make sure we have counselors in schools, 
and to make sure that uh, at the end of the day, uh, our students are getting the tools and training that they need to be successful. Uh, so this is a, a bit of a wonky issue, but we touched on it earlier, and that's procurement and government contracting. Uh, the way our Buy American rules work currently is there's a quota for the percent that has to come from, from domestically. So we have a 60% quota, which just moved up from 40% to 60% quota uh, for domestic content in our procurement policies. Um, I think that's a bad way of doing it. What ends up happening is a lot of the work ends up do being done on the East Coast at greater cost to taxpayers, and it doesn't actually do anything to uh, revitalize our economy. Uh, another way of doing it, of doing it, and this is something that local counties do, I know Alameda County does, is to look at the, uh, the impact of government decisions on employment, on direct employment, on indirect employment. Uh, what do I mean by that? You put somebody to work, they're putting other people to work in their community. Uh, we have economic models that can estimate that. Um, we should look at that and say, okay, what is the revenue that the state of California is going to get from that? Uh, what's the money that we're not going to have to spend on the social safety net as a result of that? Because unemployment has a real cost. And we should use all of that and, cut and, and score that into the, uh, the bid and evaluate the bid. Uh, we can also look at environmental impacts. Uh, we have companies that follow very good environmental standards in California. Countries, companies overseas do not. Uh, we spend a lot of money as a state trying to go green. Uh, but at the same time, we're buying uh, goods uh, from companies that are, are, are not environmentally sound at all. So we can look at environmental impacts, we can score those, uh, we can do all of those things to set up our procurement policy uh, in such a way that it's going to preference local companies here in California. Uh, so that's something that we'd like to do on day one. Thank you. Mr. Gian, you will leave this question. The question is, you have all discussed a desire to help improve education, social services, and public safety. That takes money. How will you prevent Republicans from continuing to reduce and eliminate taxes on large corporations and the super wealthy? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's not right that in California, in this community, we're cutting sports programs, we're cutting after school programs. We are gutting basic social services when you have companies such as Intel. Intel Corporation made a $25.6 billion profit. Great California company, but guess how much they paid in state taxes? Zero, that's right, they paid zero. All of us in this room, all of us have to pay taxes at uh, 11%, 10%, 9%, 9%, and I think it's only right that big corporations pay their fair share. We're the only state in the nation that doesn't have an oil severance tax. The oil that comes from the ground of California belongs to the people of California, and it's not right that we're the only state that has an oil severance tax. That can generate a billion dollars to oil companies that are making record profits today, and they will continue to make these record profits unless somebody holds them accountable. I want to go to the state legislature to serve on the Tax and Revenue Committee because I want to figure out how to close these loopholes that are as big as a school bus to make sure that we close them and make sure that we hold these corporations accountable while at the same time investing in our economy, investing in new industries that are going to attract green jobs to California, which is the future of, of the state. Mr. Guillen is, is absolutely right. It's, it's not right uh, the way that we make revenue decisions in California. Um, and Joel Young and I both will continue to work towards a two-thirds majority. We actually got to know each other uh, working to elect Joan Buchanan uh, to a seat that was never before, before held by a Democrat. Uh, it's not right, uh, but it's also reality. Um, and I, I think that we have to recognize that as smooth of a talker as he is, uh, we're not going to convince Republicans to vote for new revenue measures because that's the only power that they have right now. Uh, so we need to be focused on other things. One of those things that I think we can make happen, which I'm, I'm glad that everybody here supports, is lowering the threshold for local uh, tax measures. Uh, another thing is making California a better state to do business. I know as Democrats that's something that we don't talk about sometimes, but another way to grow revenue is to grow our economy. 
Uh, and we can simplify contracting procedures in the state. We can make it easier to get the permits you need to run a business. Uh, we read a story a month ago about it. It took a woman two years to open a soda and ice cream shop in San Francisco because the, the planning commission, all of the regulations were so complex. If it's that difficult to open a soda shop, how difficult is it to open a, a, a green tech company that can employ hundreds of people here in the county? So we need to look at that and we need to look at what we can take away, uh, not just what we can add. Because the, the revenue issue with the two-thirds rule will continue to be a problem. So large corporations and the very wealthy need to pay their fair share. It's, it's that simple. It's an equity issue, it's a justice issue, it's a fairness issue. And one of the things that we can all get behind this November is Governor Brown's compromise uh, tax proposal, which includes a tax on the wealthy. It in fact is a compromise between his original revenue enhancement package and the California Federation of Teachers millionaires tax. So it, it includes an increase in, in taxes on the, on the wealthy. I think that's uh, appropriate, and it will generate revenue up to $7.5 billion to help close our, our, def our um, budget deficit. And we need to close corporate loopholes and include taxes that we should have that we don't. One certainly is the oil extraction tax, which has been referenced earlier, of the, of the three highest oil producing states in the country. We don't have an oil extraction tax. That can generate millions and billions of dollars that can fund important services that we've been talking about tonight, like education, like social services, like job creation, like public safety. It's also important to close other corporate loopholes, like um, large corporations structuring of, of transactions where property actually does change hands, but a reassessment isn't triggered on the property. Uh, it, it's an end run and a loophole which avoids Prop 13 reassessment and an increase in, in property tax. That needs to change. So how do we change it? Two-thirds majority is, is certainly a, a component of it. We're actually, looks like we're going to get a two-thirds majority of Democrats in the Senate this year. It's also possible that we could get it in the Assembly. And also, this is the first year of open primary, and I'm open-minded about its possibility and its potential. The reason that it, it is, has been implemented is to bring more moderates from both parties to Sacramento to work together. And perhaps there will be a time in the near future because of open primary where we don't have um, ideological battles like we are now with no tax pledges. You. Thank you for your time. Okay, we're down to our final question. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the audience for their participation in submitting the questions. This will be the last one. We have limited time. So, uh, Mr. Goodwin, you're going to go first. And the question is, all Democrats support education, the environment, and job creation. What distinguishes your platform? Well, I think that, you know, we've tried to be and we will strive to be, continue to strive to be uh, very concrete on what we want to do. Uh, you know, I talked earlier about early childhood education. Uh, that's something that we should make happen on a statewide basis. Uh, I'm not sure that's possible. We're certainly going to try to do it. Uh, if we can't do it on a statewide basis, I think it is something that voters here in Alameda County value. Uh, I think we could look at a sugary beverage tax, something that the city of Richmond is looking at right now uh, as a way to fund childhood obesity programs, which are a massive issue, uh, and also to fund early child education. So, you know, I think that we're just going to continue to try and be dynamic and flexible about how we think about things. Uh, I think one of the things that, that uh, I really like about Mr. Young is that he's bold. Uh, he's not afraid to, to talk to anybody. He's not afraid to build relationships with anybody. Uh, he's not afraid to uh, challenge uh, the dominant thinking about how we approach these issues. Uh, that's one of the things that first attracted me to him as a friend. Uh, and it's the main reason I support him as a politician. We need courage in Sacramento. Uh, and so that's something that we're going to continue to try to communicate to voters. Uh, and I hope we get to know all of you better. My platform from the very beginning was improving our public schools, making our streets safer, 
creating good jobs and having a social sort of safety net to protect the most vulnerable people in our population. I'm the only one who's talked about that platform from the beginning to today. I've been consistent in that. That's what I fought for as a publicly elected official up to today. That's what I'll fight for in California, um, in Sacramento, for the people of California. And I have specific ideas about how to, how to achieve gains in each of those areas. I shared with you two of those earlier tonight. With respect to public safety, I talked about one of my proposed pieces of legislation, the Emergency Prevention Fund, and with respect to job creation, I also talked about a, an exemption for former military stations to, to help uh, have tax increment fina uh, financing and economic revitalization and job creation as a result. I also talked about a school facilities bond, which would help reinvest in our schools, so that's, that's education, will create jobs along the way. Um, and would also increase public safety by sizing the retrofitting. So those touch on all of my three areas of, of, of priority. I'm the only candidate in this race who has experience in each of those four areas, proven experience. I talked about generating $84 million for the schools in the East Bay. I'm also part of a statewide lawsuit which challenges Governor, uh, which suits Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger in the state of California for not adequately funding our public schools. Uh, we're working uh, uh, towards creating 6,000 to 9,000 good jobs in the East Bay at Alameda Point, a former military station. I've been part of decisions which helped create, um, keep roofs over people's heads and food on their table and their utilities on in their homes as the vice mayor and the president of the City Social Service Human Relations Board, so I've contributed to social services. Um, I think we need someone who has the experience, the proven track record in the areas that they talk about in their platform. I'm the only candidate that does. Thank you. I think what distinguishes my candidacy at the end of the day is that I'm the only candidate with six years of solid track record balancing budgets. As board president, I had to make tough decisions. I had, a, I had to clean up our administration, and I'm proud to announce that uh, just last week, we announced our new chancellor, Dr. Jose Ortiz, who will be taking the reins of the Peralta Community Colleges to lead us into the next uh, 10 years. Those aren't easy decisions, but what this district needs is somebody who's gonna stand up and fight tooth and nail for working people and middle class folks and making sure that we have educational opportunities. I've done that. I'm not afraid to take on the big issues. Most recently, I passed a resolution that was approved unanimously by my board, by, by my board members to divest our taxpayer dollars, up to $140 million, from the Peralta Colleges. We had accounts with the big Wall Street banks. We said, hey, you guys aren't being good community partners. We're going to take that money out and reinvest that money to local community banks and, and credit unions and create jobs right here at home. So I'm very proud of that. And uh, we need somebody in Sacramento with courage. Uh, you know, they told me, Abel, you're running for assembly. You shouldn't do that. But these are the issues that we need to fight for up in Sacramento because somebody needs to stand up against these big banks and somebody needs to go up there with a proven track record. I've worked in Sacramento. I know how to get things done. And uh, I'm ready to get started to work for you on day one. I'd like to thank all the candidates for their responses to these great questions. There were 15 questions submitted, all of them good except for one. Actually, it was, the question was, boxes or briefs, King Kong or Godzilla? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we want the reviews on those things. So. We're going to go into closing statements. So, uh, Mr. Ian, you will lead. You have uh, two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, California's three most significant areas of spending are education, healthcare, public safety. And we know that all those things are related. Good education leads to good jobs. Good jobs lead to safe communities. Safe communities lead to a healthier environment for all of us. I'm running to for the State Assembly because we need to make sure that what we spend money on, our, our taxpayers, is better connected to outcomes and results driven. We need to make sure that if we uh, invest in these areas, we want to make sure we're getting our money in return. One of the things that I want to propose to in this legislature is that on day one, I want to introduce a resolution where we don't pass uh, new laws every single year, but in a two-year cycle that we spend one year auditing programs that work and don't work. Let's invest in what does work. 
let's get rid of what doesn't work, and in the next year, let's put together legislative solutions to fix problems as to how we can uh, better grow our economy here in the state of California. Uh, I'm the only candidate running who uh, has made these tough decisions. I have the experience who in Sacramento to get things done on day one. I'm the only candidate who's been endorsed by teachers exclusively, nurses, and the Sierra Club. If you want somebody to go to Sacramento and just hold the seat warm, don't go for me. If you want somebody who's going to get up every single day and fight for our communities, I'm your guy. I ask you to vote for me and send a fighter to Sacramento who's going to fight for us every single day. Thank you. Uh, thank you first and foremost for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I know that for Joel and I both, uh, this is our favorite part of what can be a pretty grueling process. Uh, actually being able to come out and, and talk to voters uh, and get to know people uh, you know, who are not part of any interest group, uh, but are just interested in, in what's right for their community. And so uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, I know that's what he's doing right now and I know he wishes he could have been here too. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that I'd like to encourage all of you to do is to reach out and contact us. I'm sure that you have questions, I'm sure that you have issues particular to you, things that you've uh, seen happen in the state, things that you're watching happen right now that bother you. Uh, we're very accessible. Uh, I've gotten two emails, I keep trying to get people to email me, I've gotten two emails so far from voters with, with questions that they'd like to have answered. Uh, and we would like to talk to you more and talk to you more specifically about the things that are really of concern to you. Uh, so please do be in touch. Uh, it's an honor again getting to know you and I, I hope this is just the beginning of a process. Thank you for the time tonight. I'm really pleased and proud to be here. I think that uh, I offer a number of different things which we've talked about tonight. Uh, in terms of balancing budgets, I've done that uh, and, and actually then some. We actually had the three most successful years in the history of the city of Alameda Healthcare District when I was there, moving $5.5 million in a positive direction over three years, uh, which had never been done before, so that's very exciting. And I'm also proud that as a vice mayor of the city of Alameda, I made decisions to never cut street level services for police and fire for public safety. I think that's why uh, police officers and firefighters have endorsed me, as well as doctors. Uh, and public school employees. I have those exclusive endorsements. And I'm really proud um, to be someone who is attentive to uh, the entire district that they represent. San Leandro is in a new district this year. And it needs someone who understands the issues of the city from keeping San Leandro Hospital open to helping support uh, OSI soft and the fiber optic loop um, to making sure we support our schools. I've been in talks with some of your education leaders about the successes that we've had in passing the school parcel tax and how that might be helpful here and be supportive. Um, so it, it's very important to have, have someone who's also, who not just understands the district, but is able to work with a team, with a body. I've always been a team player and a team leader. I'm not going to go up to Sacramento uh, and scream from the sidelines and not be heard. My voice is going to be in the room. It's going to be part of the party agenda. It's going to be someone, I'm going to be someone who delivers to the district helps bring real and concrete success like the ones I brought already. Uh, because of that, because of my commitment to the entire district and the San Leandro, I'm really proud to have the endorsements of the majority of the San Leandro Council, including Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Gregory and Pauline Cutter, Diana Souza, Joyce DeRosiak, uh, talked about Wilma Chan and Oslo Bidger already, and uh, the police officers and, and firefighters. Uh, so I'd be honored to represent you in, in Sacramento, and thank you for the time today. This concludes the debate portion of tonight's meeting. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Dan Dillman and his family for allowing the story of Val Theater to be a... I'd like to thank all the candidates for their participation. citizens in San Leandro that came out tonight. Thank you for being here.